students. So this is my, um, my study guide for you guys for your exam number one, and I hope that you will find it very helpful. This is a more abbreviated, succinct version from uh, what I posted online earlier. So let's begin with Aristotle and the theory of spontaneous generation. So Aristotle actually popularized this idea that uh, of spontaneous generation, which basically is the idea that you could get um, living entities from non-living materials. For example, we see Phoebe the flea here um, being spontaneously generated from a dust particle. So this is the theory that living things can come from non-living things. So they believed that this was made possible due to a spiritual essence or vital heat that they called pneuma. They believed that this was the spiritual essence that made non-living things be able to uh, spontaneously give rise to living things. As far-fetched as this idea may seem, there were actually some realistic observations that did lead to the theory of spontaneous generation. Not only that, this is probably why this uh, theory of spontaneous generation persisted for so many millennia before uh, it was disproved. So the observations that led to the uh, beginning of the theory as well as the persistence of the theory of spontaneous generation is because they did not have microscopes. Um, they really could not see uh, anything that was not visible to the naked eye. And as we know, a lot of times seeing is believing. So um, because they couldn't see it, it was deemed to not exist unless it was observable with the naked eye. So the idea was that um, fish would seemingly appear in a puddle of water, for example. Maggots would appear in rotting meats. Fleas would appear out of dust particles. Mice would seemingly appear out of piles of grain. Frogs would appear along river banks, um, and so on and so forth. So the first evidence that um, we know of that was uh, against the spontaneous generation was by Francesco Reddy in uh, 1668. He conducted some experiments that just proved that maggots uh, were able to just spontaneously generate out of rotting meat directly. So uh, he demonstrated that flies must have direct contact with the rotting meat in order for the maggots to appear. The death blow to the spontaneous uh, generation theory was done by Louis Pasteur. He performed a series of experiments that presented overwhelming evidence against the theory of spontaneous generation. Pasture developed something called the swan, ne uh, swan necked flasks, and we see a illustration of one here. So these were specialized flasks that contained a swan neck tube that protruded from the top as shown here. The design allowed for air to pass through to the broth, but prevented any microbes from passing through the air into the broth. His experiment demonstrated that exposure to air alone was not enough to grow microbes in broth. The broth had to have exposure to microbes in the air in order to grow microbes in the broth. The discovery of cells and the development of cell theory was largely due to the invention of high-powered microscopes that came about in the 17th century. This led to not only the discovery of cells, but the development of what is called cell theory. The cell theory has three main statements. The fundamental unit of life is the cell. All organisms contain one or more cells. All cells come from other cells. Robert Hooke was the person who discovered cells. This occurred in 1665. He did this by observing a piece of cork under a microscope. Now cork itself is made up of dead plant cells. So he was only recognizing the cell wall um, of the plant itself. 
and he only recognized plants as having cells, but did not um, understand that animals were also made of cells. That came about slightly later. Hook named the structures that he saw in cork cells because they reminded him of the cells of a honeycomb. Hook also described cells as being uh, structures that resembled honeycombs or small boxes, bladders of air, caverns, or bubbles. Next, let's fast forward and talk about some properties of prokaryotes that are important to know for microbiology. They are very successful. They've been around billions of years largely due to the fact that they are able to uh, rapidly reproduce using a simple method called binary fission. A lot of these prokaryotes are able to survive very harsh conditions. Uh, some of these prokaryotic cells are able to produce endospores and these endospores allow them to survive uh, through long periods by basically lying dormant and not growing until uh, conditions improve. Once conditions improve, the endospore will be opened and the prokaryote will begin to carry out the uh, life processes. We have discovered bacteria in all sorts of very inhospitable environments on Earth. Um, for example, we see these creatures um, in soil samples, in sulfurous underwater sea vents, acidic hot springs like like what is shown here even radioactive waste they are also by far the most numerous life form found on earth in order to be classified as a prokaryote prokaryotes do not have a nucleus and they do not have membrane bound organelles They also have a bacterial, um, a bacterial DNA, which is in just a, a single circular chromosome. And they also have plasmids, which are just um, an additional small circular DNA. Bacteria come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. We'll discuss some of them here. Rod-shaped bacteria are called bacillus or bacilli when we're talking about more than one. One single round or uh, spherical shaped bacteria would be called coccus or cocci if uh, we're talking about more than one. A, a single spiral shaped bacteria would be spirillum. Um, if it's multiple, we would call that spirilli. Streptococcus is a multiple cocci arranged as a chain, as shown here. When we talk about a tetrad, a tetrad is four cocci that's arranged in a square, as shown, and Staphylococcus, which is multiple cocci arranged in a cluster. Uh, Diplococcus, or Diplococcus, is uh, two cocci that are um, side by side. We also have streptobacillus, which is a, uh, a linked chain made up of the uh, bacilli bacteria, which are rod shaped. We also have kind of a hybrid shape, which is uh, intermediate between, um, um, between maybe round and uh, the rod shaped bacteria. And those are the curved rod shaped or vibrio bacteria. There's also loose here, uh, loose long loose helical spiral shaped, which are your spirochetes, and uh, short rod shaped uh, bacteria, which are the cocobacillus. So let's take a look at um, the most popular version of the phylogenic uh, tree of life. Um, the study of phylogeny is also called taxonomy. So you'll, you, you'll uh, hear those terms used interchangeably at times. So all organisms are uh, currently separated into one of these three domains of the phylogenic tree of life. The three domains are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya or eukaryota. And I apologize that um, 
uh, my slide got cut off just a little bit here. Um, all organisms are considered either eukaryotic or prokaryotic depending on the type of cell that they are made up of. All prokaryotes are uh, in either the bacteria domain or the archaea domain. These bacteria usually contain a cell wall. In 1977, Carl Wos recreated the taxonomy to create three of uh, the three domains that we see here instead of just two. And the reason for this is because the archaea were not really considered a separate domain until um, some genetic work was done uh, by Carl Wos as, as well as some other uh, scientists. <clears throat> So the phylo phylogenic tree of taxonomy categorizes all organisms into one of these three domains. Uh, the eukaryota or eukarya has the eukaryotic organisms, which could be single-celled or multicellular organisms. And the archaea and bacteria are entirely made up of prokaryotic uh, organisms, which are almost always singular celled. There are very few exceptions to that. Okay, let's continue with our discuss of phylogeny and taxonomy. Eukaryotic organisms are made up of one or more eukaryotic cells belonging to the eukaryota or eukarya domain. And all prokaryotic organisms are composed of a single prokaryotic cell, or almost always, like I mentioned before briefly, and belong to either the domain bacteria or the archaea domain. The bacteria domain is separated into five phyla. The first phyla is called proteobacteria, the second is chlamydia, the third are spirochetes, the fourth is cyanobacteria, and the last is gram-positive bacteria. The proteobacteria phylum is separated into five different classes. These classes are called alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and epsilon. Let's look at some properties of the alpha proteobacteria. These are all gram-negative bacteria and they're oligotrophic. Oligotrophic uh, means that they can survive in habitats that really do not provide many nutrients at all. So these are our extremophiles. They live in extreme environments such as uh, sediments which are deep in the ocean. Um, deep in the soil, below the Earth's surface, or even inside of glacial ice. Next, let's look at some uh, real quick properties of the beta proteobacteria. Um, unlike the alpha proteobacteria, we see that the beta proteobacteria are eutrophic. These are copiotrophs. In other words, they require a lot or copious amounts of organic nutrients in order to survive. Next, we'll talk about the gamma proteobacteria. The most important thing about the gamma proteobacteria is they have a lot of species within this group that are going to be antibiotic resistant. The delta proteobacteria are an interesting class of bacteria. These are gram-negative bacteria that are able to, um, able to metabolize sulfate. Um, we can see some sulfurous compounds here and they're normally um, very toxic to life, but um, these bacteria are able to take that sulfate and reduce. So we call these gram-negative sulfate-reducing bacteria. Last, let's look at the properties of the epsilon proteobacteria. Um, these are of interest to us because these live in the digestive system of the human body. Um, 
some of these are going to cause illnesses. Um, a lot of these are benign and actually live in a symbiosis with us and assist us as, prote as uh, probiotics. One of the specific species that is important to know here is the H. pylori. If you're interested, that stands for Heliocobacter pylori. This is the bacteria that is responsible for stomach ulcers. So that was the taxonomic phylogenic um, rundown of how to classify some of these uh, prokaryotic organisms, especially bacteria. Next, let's talk about another and um, often more popular way to distinguish uh, different categories or different types of bacteria. So another way to categorize these bacteria is based on how they react to the gram stain procedure. So very briefly, um, let me give you an overview of what the gram stain procedure entails. Um, so of course there's more steps to it, but this is the, um, just the gist of what you have to know for, uh, for this class. So the gram stain procedure involves um, the application of a primary stain. This is Cressel violet. Um, and this contains a purple or bluish color. Next, the gram stain procedure involves a decolorization step. Okay. Um, so this will take out some of the color depending on the properties of the cell membrane, um, sorry, of the cell wall of the bacteria, not the membrane. Um, the last step is to use a counter stain called safranin, or sometimes something similar, um, but it will still be a red or pinkish hue. And the counter stain um, is going to stain uh, red or pink based on the properties, again, um, of the cell wall of the bacteria. Okay, so let's look at what the results would be with the gram negative, I'm sorry, with the um, gram staining protocol. Okay, so um, according to this classification, all prokaryotes are going to fall in one of these categories based on how they stain with the gram stain or even if they stain at all with the gram stain. So first we see here a uh, gram positive bacteria. Oops, so sorry. Shoot. First we see here a uh, gram positive bacteria. These appear purple or bluish because these bacteria are able to retain the Cressel violet primary stain even after the decolorization step. The primary stain then tends to block or kind of wash out or overpower the um, saffron and counter stain. So that's why you don't really see much pink or, pink or red in, in these. So because the blue or purple um, is more dominant, that really is um, basically what you see in gram-positive bacteria. However, what we see next here with the gram-negative bacteria, these are going to appear pink or red. This is due to the saffron and counter stain. Now these are able to uh, show up as pink or red because when, um, when these bacteria are stained with the primary Cressel violet and then decolorized, they lose their primary uh, color of the Cressel violet. So it does not retain the bluish purple Cressel violet stain. It actually um, gives that up. So it no longer has that. So these are going to only show um, evidence of being stained with the counter stain, which is pink or red. Lastly, um, we also have a category called atypical bacteria. The atypical bacteria are going to be bacteria that do not respond at all to either the primary stain, which is Cressel violet, or the safranin counter stain. So when these cells undergo the procedure, they are going to not show any color at all. The reason for this is usually because they lack a cell wall. We see a difference between the gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive bacteria and where they like to live. So the gram-negative bacteria live on the skin as well as your mucous membranes, such as your sinuses. Whereas the gram-positive bacteria tend to be found in the gastrointestinal tract or the urogenital tract. 
The reason for the difference between gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria is um, the gram-negative bacteria, as you'll see here, is um, only contains a thin filament of the peptidoglycan protein. So this is not strong enough to retain the crustal violet stain. Whereas in gram-positive bacteria, these have cell walls that are composed of thick peptidoglycan. And again, the atypical bacteria usually do not stain due to the fact that they do not have a cell wall. Another way to categorize bacteria is based upon their need for oxygen. There are two categories, aerobes and anaerobes. So aerobes are prokaryotic organisms that require oxygen. Anaerobes are microbes that do not require oxygen. Some of these microbes might even find um, oxygen poisonous or toxic, which might lead them to die. Um, some types of bacteria that are um, anaerobes can be found in the human mouth, sinuses, throat, or lower bowels. There's another interesting class of bacteria that are called deeply branching bacteria. These bacteria are very ancient and extremely resilient. Um, these are um, extremophiles that can live in temperatures near the boiling point of water. So they're very resilient and can live in very harsh environments as shown here in these hot springs. Another class of bacteria is the CFB bacteria. You see the full name here, which now you know why we just simply call it the CFB bacteria, because nobody wants to say all of those syllables. This phylum includes healthy bacteria of the human digestive tract. So when you're taking your probiotics, you'll see many of those species uh, in your uh, probiotics. And these are important to um, aid digestion, include um, improve bowel movement, and even to uh, prevent harmful bacteria from multiplying in the, in the uh, intestines. Okay, next let's talk about some uh, microbial metabolism. Metabolism is defined as all of the chemical reactions or physical mechanisms that are needed to keep your cells alive. Metabolism has two forms. Um, you have anabolism, which is going to be taking smaller molecules and building those up, creating larger molecules from those smaller mole molecules. So this process requires energy in the form of ATP. Versus catabolism. This is when we take larger molecules and we break those apart in order to release energy that will be harnessed in the form of ATP. In order to do these metabolic processes, we need enzymes for a lot of these steps. Enzymes are very specific. They must fit together with the molecules they are acting upon in a lock and key fashion. Enzymes are called catalysts. They catalyze reactions by decreasing the activation energy needed in order for the reaction to proceed. In essence, the enzyme speeds up the reaction. Now, without the, act, without the enzyme being present, the chemical reaction will still take place. However, in order for the human body to digest one hamburger, it could take decades without the help of enzymes. So even though the process would proceed without the addition of the enzyme, having the enzyme present allows our body to uh, metabolize things fast enough so that we can continue to live. Otherwise, we would starve to death. Enzymes are not considered reactants or products in chemical reactions. They are not consumed and they are not altered when they catalyze a reaction. So for this reason, they are reusable. There are different factors that are going to affect um, enzymes. Only a couple of them are shown here. 
Um, so there's a narrow range of temperature that enzymes will be able to, um, to function at their best. Um, also, if there's a shape change um, due to um, pH or temperature or uh, maybe the binding of, uh, of some type of inhibitor or substrate um, can also be a factor here. So let's look at two different types of competition that we see for these enzymes. We've got competitive inhibitors and non-competitive inhibitors. A competitive inhibitor is going to compete for the same binding site that the substrate would like to use. We call this the active site. Whereas in non-competitive inhibition, we see that the in inhibitor is actually going to bind to a site other than the active site. So they are not competing for the same site. However, when this inhibitor does bind to what we call this allosteric um, binding site, we actually see a conformational shape change in the active site or the substrate binding site. Remember, it has to fit in the lock and key, key mechanism. So when there is a structural shape conformational change with the substrate binding site, this is not going to allow, um, this is going to inhibit that substrate from binding. So in this way, it's going to uh, allosterically inhibit as a non-competitive inhibitor of the enzyme. Okay, so this is ATP. We've, um, you're probably very familiar with ATP right now. Um, the important thing to know here is that um, ATP is aden um, adenine uh, triphosphate, and the phosphate groups that contain a lot of um, energy in those bond. So when that phosphate-phosphate bond is broken, we get energy that is released. When that bond is broken, it's going to release that phosphate group and it will become ADP. Think of ADP as a battery that has been drained and needs to be recharged by becoming ATP in order to be used for energy again in the cell. There are three different mechanisms that bodies use or cells use to create this vital ATP, which is the energy that the cell must run on. The first mechanism is substrate level phosphorylation. This occurs when a phosphate group is transferred from some other molecule and it gets put on ADP to create ATP. The second method is oxidative, um, oxidative phosphorylation. This is when the phosphate is added to ADP, but this is uh, done through a series of um, oxidation reduction reactions that occur doing, during a cellular respiratory pathway. We see this, um, for example, in the electron transport chain, which is the last step in the cellular respiration process inside the cell. We also have a method of, uh, not in our bodies, but in a lot of autotrophs, we have photophosphorylation. This is when phosphate groups are able to be added to ADP in order to make ATP using energy collected from sunlight. There are three metabolic strategies that we see cells use in order to get the energy that they need to make ATP. The first is aerobic cellular respiration, which in a nutshell is glycolysis, followed by the citric acid cycle, and finally ending up with the electron transport chain. With aerobic cellular respiration, um, this requires oxygen and oxygen is actually used as the final electron acceptor in the process. This is a little bit different from anaerobic cellular respiration. However, anaerobic cellular respiration still goes through the same glycolysis process, the same citric acid cycle, and pretty much the same electron transport chain cycle as well. The difference though is that instead of using oxygen as the final electron acceptor, another inorganic molecule besides oxygen will be used as the final 
electron acceptor. Some examples of this are uh, iron compounds, sulfates, nitrates, and nitrites. The third is fermentation. In the fermentation process, this includes undergoing glycolysis only. It does not undergo the citric acid cycle or the electron transport chain. An organic molecule is used as the final electron acceptor versus um, other strategies that um, always use the inorganic, um, an inorganic electron acceptor. For example, when our muscles do this, uh, we make lactic acid and we actually use uh, pyruvate as the final electron acceptor in our muscles when they undergo uh, lactic acid fermentation. Oxygen is not needed for um, anaerobic cellular respiration or for fermentation. I'm just gonna have to edit that out, but hurry, because I don't wanna screw it up, okay. <clears throat> All right, there are three metabolic strategies. Um, so the aerobic respiration is the most efficient. It can produce up to 38 ATP. We've got anaerobic respiration, which depending on the methods used, it can vary between uh, producing two ATP all the way up to 36 ATP. The fermentation process is the least efficient of the metabolic strategies and produces a maximum of only two ATP. Here's a couple of uh, categories that you need to know that are based on how energy is obtained by the prokaryote or um, the organism in general. So we've got autotrophs versus heterotrophs. So organisms that can synthesize their own food from inorganic sources are called autotrophs. For example, we see that some bacteria cells or prokaryotes can actually use carbon dioxide in the air as their carbon source. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, are organisms that cannot synth synthesize their own food. So these organisms must consume organic molecules in the forms of sugars, proteins, or lipids. Here is a summary of organism classifications based on energy or electron sources. So let's look at some of these to make sure that we understand. Chemotrophs are going to either be chemoheterotrophs or chemoautotrophs. Let's first look at chemoheterotrophs. Chemoheterotrophs are also called chemoorganotrophs. These organisms are going to use organic chemical compounds as their electron source. These are proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates. The chemoheterotrophs that are able to use oxygen are going to undergo aerobic cellular respiration. The chemoheterotrophs that are not able to use oxygen will undergo the process of anaerobic cellular respiration. Chemoautotrophs or chemolithotrophs have the ability to use carbon dioxide as their source of carbon. They use inorganic chemical compounds such as the electron acceptor uh, sulfur, iron, uh, carbon, monoxide, and hydrogen as their final electron acceptors. Phototrophs have the unique ability to use sunlight as their energy source. Phototrophs that use organic compounds like proteins, lipids, and carbohydrates as a carbon source are called photoheterotrophs. Phototrophs that use carbon dioxide as a carbon source are called photoautotrophs. Photoautotrophs that release oxygen as a waste product are called oxygenic photosynthesizers. And photoautotrophs that do not release oxygen as a waste product would be called anoxygenic photosynthesizers.
here are some interesting uh, energy sources that some of these uh, uh, chemoheterotrophs or chemolithotrophs uh, can use. Um, so chemolithotropes are able to use um, inorganic chemical compounds as their electron source. Um, we see some of these inorganic compounds are extremely toxic to other life forms. We see, for example, toluene, which is um, uh, used as an industrial solvent, um, ammonia, which is used as a cleaner, and arsenic, which we know is a poison for humans. This is just a summary of the uh, flow chart that we saw earlier, and I wanted to just add that in case you wanted to print that out or use it as an additional study guide. Okay, so let's take an overview of cellular respiration. So in cellular respiration, it has three processes, but it also has one vital transition reaction that in microbiology, especially since that, um, that transition reaction produces something that we're interested in, which is NADH, um, we like to add that here, even though it's not really considered a separate, well, it's not really considered a process. If you look at almost any textbook, a lot of times they'll will just show three processes that are involved here and omit the transition reaction. So, um, but I will be um, talking about that as well for completeness sake. <clears throat> so here we see the overall reaction of cellular respiration. Um, in a nutshell, we see that glucose and oxygen are going to be used in order to make carbon dioxide, water, and ATP. Glycolysis is performed in all living organisms. Glycolysis always takes place in the cytoplasm of the cell. Glycolysis does not require oxygen and can be performed in both aerobic and anaerobic prokaryotes. Glycolysis can be broken down into two phases, an energy investment phase in which two ATP molecules are used to start the glycolysis process. Later in glycolysis, we get an energy payoff phase. In the energy payoff phase, four ATP molecules are produced. The net gain for glycolysis then is two ATP molecules. Glycolysis begins with one glucose molecule. Glycolysis produces two ATP net. Glycolysis also produces NADH, which performs the vital function of carrying electrons to the electron transport chain. The end product of glycolysis are two pyruvate molecules. There are three glycolysis pathways. The glycolytic pathway used by most organisms is the emden meyerhoff parnas pathway or EMP pathway, which is what we were just looking at. But there are also the ED pathway and the PPP pathway. The ED glycolysis pathway is interestingly the only form of glycolysis used by the gram-negative pathogen, Pseudomonas, Arginosa. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is a common bacteria known for being antibiotic resistance, resistant. This pathogen causes many of the hospital acquired infections known today. Also, E. coli is able to use this pathway, but it can switch as needed to the EMP pathway as well. The last pathway is very important for all organisms. This is the pentose phosphate pathway or PPP glycolysis pathway. The PPP glycolysis pathway creates building blocks or precursors that are used for amino acids and nucleotides. This form of glycolysis will take place anytime the cell is in need of amino acids or nucleotides. Before a pyruvate molecule can enter the Krebs cycle, it first may undergo a transition reaction. After glycolysis, each of the pyruvate molecules that were produced will be transformed into acetyl-CoA. During this process, we have carbon dioxide released and NADH is produced. <clears throat> 
but no ATP is produced in this step. After the transition step, acetyl-CoA will enter the Krebs cycle. Here in the Krebs cycle, we will have more NADH and FADH2 produced. One ATP is also produced by substrate level phosphorylation. Also, we are going to get more carbon dioxide released. So keep in mind that one glucose molecule will take two turns or two cycles of the Krebs cycle in order to be fully processed. The last process in cellular respiration is the electron transport chain, sometimes called oxidative phosphorylation. The ATP formed in the electron transport chain, or ETC, is formed using oxidative phosphorylation. There is an enzyme that is needed for this process, and this is the ATP synthase. The ATP synthase is, in essence, what creates the ATP. The electron transport chain exists in the plasma membrane of, of prokaryotic cells. Let's look briefly at the steps of the electron transport chain process. So all of the NADH and FADH2 that were generated in the previous steps of cellular respiration, this includes glycolysis, the transition reaction, and the Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. So the NADH and FADH uh, that were created from these um, different processes will now deliver those electrons that they gained um, from those processes. They're going to deliver the electrons to the electron transport chain. Once at the electron transport chain, let's look at what happens. The hydrogens um, are taken off of the NADH and the FADH2, and they will go to the first complex of the electron transport chain. Now, I um, need to give you a little bit of chemistry here so you understand what's going on. Um, hydrogen is made up of one proton and one electron, which hopefully you remember. The electron is going to get pulled off here um, in the electron transport chain. So now the proton and the electron are going to be separated from one another. Um, it is the, um, the electron is going to go through the different complexes in the electron transport chain. Now what is left over is the hydrogen ion. Once, the, uh, once hydrogen loses its electron, it becomes H plus or hydrogen ion. Um, in essence, this is just a proton. Protons are pumped out of the membrane using a proton pump. So they're going to be pumped out of the membrane and they're going to go into the space between the membrane and the cell wall. So the proton pump and the action of this proton pump is going to create what's called a concentration or more specifically an electrochemical gradient. The proton pump will move protons from inside the cell to outside the cell between the cell wall and the cell membrane. The protons will want to get back in into the cell wall due to its electrochemical gradient. This is called uh, chemiosmosis. This, force, this forces the protons to travel through the ATP synthase in order to get back to the cell. As the protons, or H+, travel through the ATP synthase, this is going to give off the energy that's needed for the ATP synthase to make ATP. In aerobic respiration, oxygen is going to be the final electron acceptor in the terminal step of cellular respiration. A single oxygen molecule is going to catch two electrons that are coming off of the end of the electron transport chain. The oxygen molecule is also going to pick up two protons from the surrounding intracellular fluid. This means oxygen is adding two hydrogen molecules to become water. In anaerobic respiration, 
on different inorganic molecule, such as nitrates or nitrites typically, will be used as the final electron acceptor in the terminal step of the electron transport chain. Obligate anaerobes will use anaerobic respiration. The cell also has processes that it uses to break down or catabolize proteins and lipids. The important thing to know here is that these other pathways will merge with the pathway of cellular respiration, as shown here. But what about fermentation? So let's just revisit this again. So uh, fermentation is um, not nearly as efficient as aerobic acceleration, uh, sorry, as aerobic cellular respiration or anaerobic cellular respiration as shown here. And fermentation only gives us about two ATP per uh, glucose molecule consumed. Obligate anaerobes are prokaryotes that require oxygen for their metabolism. Humans are an example of obligate aerobes, since we absolutely depend on the presence of oxygen. Obligate anaerobes are prokaryotes that do not need or cannot be exposed to oxygen, and these only undergo anaerobic metabolism, or anaerobic cellular respiration. These are classified as obligate anaerobes. Botulinum toxin is one of these. Interestingly, we also get facultative anaerobes. These prokaryotes have metabolic flexibility. They have metabolic pathways that they use when oxygen is present and a different set of metabolic pathways it can use when oxygen is gone or absent. An example of a bacteria that uses this is the bacteria that is responsible for staph infections and strep throat. Alcoholic fermentation is one of the types of fermentation. Um, so these organisms um, do not require um, oxygen. Um, fermentation is going to take place in the absence of oxygen and it's going to use an organic molecule such as pyruvate as a final electron acceptor. Uh, remember these only undergo glycolysis. Fermenting organisms produce two ATPs per, um, per single glucose molecule. The yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the microbe that is commonly used for alcoholic fermentation, baking, or even biofuel production. Now this is not a bacteria, this is actually a yeast. What is a yeast? Yeast are single-celled fungi that belong to the fungi kingdom in the eukaryota domain or eukarya domain. This means they're eukaryotic. A different type of fermentation is lactic acid fermentation. Um, fermentation by some bacteria, like those used in yogurt and other soured foods, um, and by animals in mussels during oxygen depletion, like our own mussels do, is um, the process called lactic acid fermentation. Lactic acid bacteria are a special type of bacteria that are known to use lactic acid fermentation. We can just call these LAB. Many LAB are gram negative and they're used in food production for some types of yogurts and cheeses. A different type of organism is actually able to undergo heterolactic fermentation. Heterolactic fermentation means that these cells are able to produce more than one fermentation product. We actually uh, use these types of bacteria to undergo heterolactic fermentation to make pickled foods like our pickle. The fermentation process gives off carbon dioxide gas as a waste product. This means the bubbles in your champagne or beer and the holes in your bread and cakes are all due to little tiny bubbles made by carbon dioxide that was released as a waste product in the fermentation process. There are a few enzymes that you should know.
and they have convenient names. We have lipases that function to, to take apart triglycerides. They're going to take apart triglycerides into their uh, glycerol component and their fatty acid subunits. Phospholipases are able to disassemble phospholipids breaking apart the phosphorylated head unit from the individual fatty acid tails. Beta, oxidase, um, sorry, beta oxidation is a process that um, disassembles fatty acids. Proteases disassemble proteins by breaking the larger proteins into smaller amino acid segments that are called peptides. Lastly, one word about photosynthesis. Have you ever noticed that the chemical equation for aerobic cellular respiration and photosynthesis are basically the same, but in reverse? So we see here that the reactants of cellular respiration are the products of photosynthesis. And the products of cellular respiration are the reactants in photosynthesis.